So good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this event of the Edinburgh Centre for Private Law, uh, in which we will celebrate the work of David Seller. Thank you all for joining us today. It's wonderful to see so many of you and from all uh, different types of jurisdictions. Uh, my name is Alexandra Brown and I will chair the first part uh, of this launch of uh, the following volume, <coughs> Continuity, Influences and Integration in Scottish Legal History, Select Essays of uh, David Seller, edited by Professor Hector McQueen and published in the Edinburgh Studies in Law series. Hector has put an enormous amount of work and care into publishing this wonderful volume and I'm deeply grateful uh, to him and I'd like to thank him uh, before we start. Um, now we will start off with four speakers um, and uh, each of the speakers have been asked to comment on a particular aspect of David Seller's work. We'll then have 15 minutes break uh, followed by uh, four more speakers. Um, now, don't worry, we won't be here all weekend. Uh, we've asked the speakers to speak uh, between 10 to 15 minutes and if there is a bit of time for comments and questions that will be just before the break. Um, can I just one housekeeping uh, uh, message? Uh, I've been told to ask uh, colleagues to keep the microphones off and possibly the the um, to have only speakers uh, on the video so that it doesn't affect the internet connection of the majority of our um, guests. Without further delay, uh, I will invite uh, Professor Hector McQueen, Emeritus Professor of Private Law at the University of Edinburgh to introduce the volume and the event. Hector, over to you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, it is a pleasure, if in some ways uh, a sad one, for me to present this collection of the legal history essays by my late teacher and friend, David Seller. My intellectual and personal debt to him is immense, and one that I can only partly repay through gathering his work together uh, in this way. Now, the most useful contribution I can offer in opening this seminar is to explain the book's title, David emphasized first and above all the continuity of legal development in Scotland, but that left open the question of how the system changed as it evidently had over the long durée. Change in David's view was brought about by the play of external influences upon indigenous customs from very early times on. But the indigenous was not erased in this process so that down to the present, Scots law embraces Celtic and other customary elements, reaching far back into its past, while also having been open since the Middle Ages to innovation from the developing canon, civil, feudal, and English common law. And all this has left deep marks upon the law's character as a mixed legal system. Now, David was most interested by the medieval period of Scots law, in part, this sprang from his other central research interest, medieval Highland and Islands history and genealogy. And that clearly informed the fresh contribution that he was able to make to Scottish legal history, where previous writers had simply passed over any Highland and Islands dimension to legal development. David dug deep, not only into the Celtic law of the Highlands and the Western Isles, but also the Norse Eudal law of Orkney and Shetland. He was able to show that in at least some aspects, these continue to form part of current Scots law and must therefore have had a continuous history, despite sitting alongside the other strands of influence to which we will come in a moment. A key example of an institution reaching far back into the Celtic past, dealt with in a posthumously published paper, was Lord Lyon, King of Arms which office David himself held with distinction from 2008 to 2014. Another example, or one that had apparently disappeared in the course of the 19th century, was the Burr Law, where Norse influence, probably mediated through the English Dane law rather than the Northern Isles, was crucial in the development of a long-lasting customary form of local disputes settlement. David agreed with previous writers in seeing the pre-1300 expansion of Scottish royal justice as heavily influenced by the contemporary growth of English royal justice as the enduring institution of the common law. But he differed from them in seeing that English influence was not cut off by the wars of independence between 1296 
and the mid 14th century. Institutions of the Scottish common law, such as the itinerant justiciar and the locally based sheriff established over the previous 200 years, continue to function along with the feudal structure of land law, including succession to land, which also took shape in Scotland in the century after the Norman conquest of England in 1066. There was of course further development as well as continuity in these aspects of the system with the justiciar becoming the modern Lord Justice General at the head of the High Court of Justiciary in the 17th century, and the law's feudal aspects being continually adjusted and reformed until brought to an end by the abolition of feudal tenure, etc., cetera, uh, Scotland Act 2000. Another key influence, the law of the Western Church, canon law from the 12th century on. David developed a series of powerful studies which demonstrated not only continued significance in the later Middle Ages, but also continuing effect despite the statutory abolition of papal jurisdiction at the Scottish Reformation in 1560. What had originally been canon law administered in the church courts, notably the law of marriage and movable succession, became entwined with and in effect part of the Scots common law administered in the secular courts. Moreover, even before the Reformation, Canon law had influenced the secular criminal law into recognition of different degrees of culpability for homicide based on the blameworthiness of the accused's conduct. David was notably less sweeping in his assessment of the influence of Roman or civilian law upon the development of Scots law. He drew particular attention to the views of 16th and 17th century writers such as Thomas Craig uh, and Stair for whom in the hierarchy of legal sources of their time, Roman law ranked after canon law, with native written and customary law ranking above both. Roman law was not a direct source, but rather a point of comparison, accepted not by reason of any innate authority, but for the good sense and equity of its solutions as evidence of the requirements of natural law. It could also influence the terminology of the law, as for example, in converting the vernacular widows and bairns parts of movable succession to use relicti and legitim, or inaptly applying the Roman politatio to the concept of unilateral promise. Now this process could further be used to disguise what was really canon law influence as in the law of persons or the pressing of feudal wine into Roman bottles uh, as in the case of servitudes. So the, the reception of Roman law was thus far from covering the whole of Scots law. David was however equally far from denying civil, civilian influence altogether. He saw its importance in providing the law with overall structure and intellectual coherence. He accepted that the law of movable property had been strongly influenced by Roman law, as also the use of the conditione sine liberis and the concept of donatio mortis causa in movable succession. The unique Scots law and the general enforceability of unilateral promises stem from Stair's engagement with the civilian legal thinking of his time. The chapter on the law of presumptions is another illustration of the persistence of civilian influence almost down to the present. But these examples also show in David's view that acceptance of the specifics of Roman law was far from total or complete even in the most affected areas. Instead, Roman law in particular, as it come to be interpreted and applied in the European use community, provided a platform upon which the Scottish common law could continue to build through native juristic writings and court decisions. The law's history in Scotland in David's view was thus one of continuity with change brought about by openness to new, mostly external influences which were then integrated with and developed within an existing institutional and increasingly intellectual structure. The brilliant juristic work of Craig and Stair consolidated the law while at the same time further shaping and elaborating its form and substance. It's much to be regretted that David was not given time to draw together the threads and themes of his research in a single monograph, as I know he hoped. But this collection allows his work to be seen as a substantial and substantive whole, constituting a truly significant contribution to the history and understanding of the unique legal system that is Scots law.
A further question which we may, be, we may begin to address today, however, is how far the questions he raised have a wider application for legal history in Britain, the rest of Europe, uh, and indeed beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hector, for this um, introduction to the volume and to the work of David Seller. And uh, I shall pass now uh, the word to Alice Taylor, who is um, Professor of Medieval History at uh, King's College London. Um, thank you very much, Alexandria. Can you all um, hear me first and foremost? Excellent. Um, so my job here today is to talk all about the overall contribution David made to the area of Celtic law, and I'd like to start by saying it's a real honour to do so. I didn't know David very well, but on the few occasions we did meet, he was unfailingly welcoming and encouraging, even reading a couple of drafts, draft publications for me when he had absolutely no obligation to do so. And so having someone with David's immense expertise and general humanity extend an intellectual hand is something that I will always remember and always be grateful for. Now, Celtic law is, of course, a difficult concept to work with, and increasingly so, I think, and that's something I'll come back to. But the fact that we can think with it at all in both the history of Scots law and medieval Scottish history is to a large part down to David's work. David understood Celtic law as a legal system, as opposed to feudal law, common law, canon law, Roman law. His crucial interventions over, this, over a series of publications was to offer a full correction to the then dominant position that Celtic law did not survive the 11th century, when in a, a traditional narrative, Scotland begins to feudalize, thereby bringing in a new system of land law, which fundamentally restructures older socio-legal relationships. And over many publications, David demonstrated a number of survivals which were integral to the legal system as a whole. He showed, for example, that coin, a tribute render to a superior, survived well into the modern period. He showed the long-term continuities of differing marriage customs. He showed the continuing relevance of compensation according to status for death and violent injury to the criminal law. And he revealed that one could trace a straight line of development from the Gallic speaking judge, the Breathe, first referenced in the 12th, early 12th century to the doomster of the court. He showed in his words that there was, quote, no outright rejection of Celtic law, and the common law of Scotland has, in part at least, a Celtic base. Now, as David noted, much of what survives of Celtic law in Scotland is through its integration into other modes. Um, for those of you who are kind of aware of these pieces of work, even textually, so Leges into Bretos et Scotos um, is integrated into the text known as the Leges Scotiae, the laws of Scotland. The Gallic surety known as the Culrath is integrated into baronial jurisdiction. The Gallic judge is integrated into some of the legal procedures of royal courts. And in this way, by adopting the kind of retrogressive approach, David was able to sketch a legal system about honour, status, compensation, freedom, half freedom, marriage and fosterage, which could be glimpsed despite the new clothes it was wearing. But because, as Hector has already said, David did not focus only on survival, but integration, he therefore provided us with the tools to see that these elements of different systems all interacted with one another to create this different autonomous but open legal system. So to take one example, the kind of earliest um, legal tractate, which major legal tractate, which survives from Scotland, Regiam Maestatum, tells us that, for example, if a Lord slept with a married female serf, and this was proven by the Visnet, the local neighborhood jury, then both the woman and, and her husband could legally demand their freedom, but could expect no other enach from the Lord. Now, enach is a Gallic word, and it means a compensation payment for insult. We find equivalents in Welsh law in the word sahad, where it is applied in many, many different contexts. The Visnet, the panel of neighbors, however, is understood to be a later innovation based in fact on the English common law. We therefore see integration um, between what might think the world of judgment on the one hand and compensation on the other. And the survival of the form of justice in, in Bill Miller's words is kind of getting even may, and you can see this trend in David's work, explain the rich world of compromise, arbitration, compensation, which is actually kind of the bedrock 
of local regional dispute settlements in the later Middle Ages. But also, and then this is another uh, thread that one could see through David's work, that perhaps even helped to explain why it was that equity doesn't develop in Scots law as a, as a separate field of jurisdiction as it did in England. And this, this kind of question, um, I think, is a particularly useful and clearly expressed preoccupation in David's work, but it's slightly beyond my remit here. Um, in the last part of what I want to say, I want to ask the question of why was identifying the survival and integration of parts of quote unquote Celtic law in Scotland significant? Well, first, it helps us explain why things had developed the way they did, he wrote. Um, it, but more than that, it helped to broaden the terms of the debate of the extent to which and from when Scots law was, in his word, a mixed system. And David showed that this question was a fundamental one to the whole of Scots law. Um, not just from the 18th century, but from the 13th century, when the idea of a common law in Scotland first begins to circulate. And this was a key intervention to make at a point when um, many historians were claiming that unlike its English counterpart, the medieval period contributed nothing of direct relevance to the history of Scots law. But the significance was more than a chronological one. Um, he forced us to question what, literally what ingredients were in the mix is that it's not simply common versus civilian, nor civilian versus canon, nor precedent versus authority, but he wrote a kind of melange of different influences which had been integrated and adapted. So this approach didn't just speak to lawyers and historians of law, I should say, it also spoke to and resonated with medieval history more broadly, um, which from the 1970s and 80s onwards was very much breaking down in a postmodern way the natural link, quote unquote, between people, culture, law, and language. Um, David particularly acknowledged his debt to the work of Def Geoffrey Barrow, who was demonstrating socioeconomic survivals from Gaelic Scotland in the period which Barrow himself described as the Anglo-Norman era in Scottish history. And David's contributions here in some way was to move these socioeconomic survivals into the legal field. But there was more resonance here too. So medieval history in the 80s and 90s, um, when David was preoccupied with the question of Celtic survival, for example, in his 1985 O'Donnell lecture, um, medieval history was getting to grips with what it meant to do British and Irish history. You know, was there such a thing as medieval British history? Now, the late Sir, Sir Rhys Davies gave his 1988 Wiles lecture, which would be published two years later as Domination and Conquest, explained that basically what he thought the way in which British history could be told was as a story of English dominance and conquest over the archipelago. And I think, though I'd be interested to hear what others say, that David would by default have disagreed. Um, and his work in this field allowed for some of the major substantive critiques um, of Rhys Davies's picture um, to actually come from historians of medieval Scotland. So David's work therefore has a kind of triple res resonance for both the history of Scots law, widening the civilian common divide. It has for medieval Scottish history, challenging the paradigm of normalization and medieval history more broadly, complicating our sense of cultural, social and economic as well as legal change. Now, despite his work on Celtic law as a constituent part of the history of Scots law, David remarked that the history of Celtic law in Scotland remains to be written. And I think it's probably true to say that it still is. And so as a result, I think it's worth ending by asking why. Now the easy but not complete answer is the nature of the evidence. We have no equivalent to the corpus of Cuthreith Howell in Wales or Shenachus Moore in Ireland. All we have to work with are chance references or collections of texts in newly donned forms. But, David would also say, I think, that the point that to write a history of Celtic law in Scotland is to realise quickly that one is writing a history of law in Scotland, of Scots law as a mixed legal tradition. But the second reason why the history of Celtic law in Scotland is yet to be written is obviously because of the problems of Celtic law as a concept, difficulties which I think are very much different to those inherent in Roman law or canon law or even common law. Because for a long time, Celtic law was not just understand, stood as a total legal system, it was a racialized legal system. It was the law as held and practiced by the Celts, by Gallic speakers, by Britonic speakers. And indeed, if we think about how the elements of Celtic law are identified in Scotland, it's through the language of written words. How are the elements of, Gal of Celtic law identified? Celtic law is held together in Scotland through language. And this poses, I think, significant practical and methodological problems. So to take an example, um, for those of you who have read the book as a whole, um, you know, 
and David himself poses this question. Yes, for example, the word morve continues to be used to mean Lord, but does that mean the morve in its 11th, 12th century guise as a ruler in some way of a region of the kingdom and great kin group? Perhaps not, perhaps it just means a Lord. So the relationship between law as system and language as identifier of that system needs to be critically approached. And of course, in the later 19th and 20th century, the link between law, language and people was a naturalized one. So Cosmo Innes in his sketches of early Scottish history wrote with great confidence that, you know, I believe Scotland at the different eras of her history used the laws of the people cognate to her then dominant race, whilst under a Celtic sway, her laws were those which have received a certain shape and, def and definiteness, definitiveness, definiteness, um, from their longer use and greater cultivation in Ireland. Now, here is not the place to rehearse the kind of long-standing arguments about how this, these ideas of law shaped a broader sense of Celtic inferiority. But it's always worth remembering, I think, that Celtic law um, was framed politically as much as it was legally. And that crucially similar strategies were used in the 14th century and in the 12th century as much as in the 19th and the 20th century. So in 1305, Edward commands that the custom usage of the Britons and the Scots should never again be used in the kingdom. According to the 12th century chronicler William of Malmesbury, David III offered essentially a three-year tax exemption to anyone who would cease from practicing his new kingdom's barbarous customs. So the history of Celtic law in Scotland is therefore as much a political history as it is a legal history. So where do we go from here? David's work, I think, offers a way through the intersections between politics and law, which necessarily crisscross any inquiry into Celtic law. One of the words which I, I think it was Hector who chose um, for the title of the collection of David's essays is this word integration. Now, the Latin word integare quite literally means from, from integer quite literally means to make whole, oneness. And I, as I've already said, David talked a great deal about equivalence and integration. It was the nature of the system which was integrated, mixed and flexible and open to outside influence. And we see this so much in the Scottish legal material. So Reggie and Maya Startem, to go back to that, for example, spoke of the, um, the Scottish mayor or crowner, he says, or Torshredor as having responsibilities for accusations of rape. Now, did these words, we ask ourselves, refer to the same position in different languages, or are they actually different official positions which may serve the same function? Could they be different positions, but could they be held by the same individual? Now, Regiam doesn't say, so we don't know. But perhaps David would say that its ambiguity is conscious. It's indicative of the flexible nature of the laws of the realm. So the history of Celtic law in Scotland is to be written then. It would surely need to address the circumstances in which certain parts of the law come to be identified as Celtic and disaggregated from the wider whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alice, uh, for not just giving us more uh, of a picture of what it means to talk about Celtic law, but also of David Sellers' contribution in this field. Um, I shall now pass the word to Dick Helmholtz, who will speak, I think, about uh, David's contribution in the area of canon law. Can you hear me now? Good. Well, I, I have three things to say. The first is personal, uh, the second descriptive, and the third is evaluative of, uh, of David's contribution to the history of Scots law. So the first, as part of a project in comparative law convoked by the initiative of Helmut Cohen and the energy of Knut Nur, David and I were once assigned to edit a volume on the history of the law of presumptions. Not a very exciting topic, you might say, but we couldn't say no to uh, either of these German scholars. And in fact, they, they had a respectable reason for their choice. Legal presumptions matter. They matter now and they've mattered a long time. And they also have been a common feature of many legal regimes, despite the criticism often leveled against them. So recognizing uh, that reality, David and I assembled 
10 additional con contributors and met together with them to share our findings. Whatever you think of the outcome, the resulting book was published in 2009, and I'm told there are a few copies still available for sale. Uh, but the project uh, gave me the opportunity to meet and to work with David, whom I'd scarcely known before. And it was a real opportunity, a happy and memorable one. He proved to, proved to be learned and able, sensible too. Whatever differences of opinion we had, and they were very few, we settled easily and we ended as friends, something that's not the inevitable result of a joint scholarly undertaking. The second, a word about the place of the canon law in scholarship devoted to Scottish legal history. Has it played any significant part in the growth and development of Scots law? That's the descriptive question. You've heard a little bit about it from our convener uh, already. Uh, and uh, as a research strategy, I, I decided to focus my inquiry into the subject uh, on Scots lawyers who one, wrote about legal history, two, lived in the 20th century, and three, were raised to the peerage. In other words, Lord Cooper of Colross and Lord Lyon, King of Arms. No one else met, no one else known to me, there may be others, but no one else known to me uh, met my objective test. But what a contrast between the two. The former had little to say about the canon law, very little. What there is, is only on a theoretical level as a possibility of influence, not as a fact. Speaking of the 12th and 13th century, uh, Lord Cooper wrote that it was natural that the English laws uh, were brought into Scotland. When, when they were brought into Scotland, they were superimposed upon a stratum of local customary law and a certain amount of canon and Roman law. And he left the subject at that. Even in a paper called Curiosities of Medieval Scots Law, there's no sign that he found anything worth saying about the canon law's place in the legal history of Scotland. Turning to Lord Lyon, you'll know that the reverse is true. His research led him to the conclusion, quote, that the influence of canon law on later Scots law was long lasting and profound. He also explored in some detail the myriad ways in which that influence made itself felt. In the law of contracts, marriage and divorce, testamentary administration, crime and civil procedure. And he went into detail, stressing the relevance of the fact that the four first four presidents of the 16th century court of sessions had been clerics trained in the canon and civil laws. As our convener, Hector McQueen's essay, Canon Law, Custom and Legislation in the Reign of Alexander II has shown, this has been a long-lived long feature of Scottish legal history. My third subject, the study of the medieval canon law is undergoing something of a transformation these days. I think this is what I can add to the, uh, uh, the subject, um, and, and, I, and I want to stress it. From the Maitland to Walter Ullman, the medieval canon law was regarded as a papal document. Its theme and its purpose uh, was to establish the supremacy and legislative powers of the papacy. But thanks to uh, the scholarship of Anne Duggan, Danica Summerlin, Charles Donahue, and several others. It's now being recognized that today's embrace of legal positivism and its rejection of both custom and natural law as significant sources of law have distorted our understanding of the history of the medieval canon law. The Liber Extra was very far from a code in the modern sense. It was not even legislation. It was a collaborative effort in which the contributions of bishops and the jurists dispersed throughout Europe were as important as the papal initiative. The importance of the communis opinio of the medieval jurists and their continuing reliance upon Roman law must themselves be accorded their due in evaluating the role canon law played in Scotland. In practice, 
the medieval canon law left ample room for change and local variation, even rejection of individual decretals. This all happened a tribute to local customs and the particular instance interests of the people governed by the canon law. As David's scholarship made a con contribution to understanding this way of understanding the history of the canon law? Well, yes and no, or rather no and less, yes. No in the sense that the, that the nature of the canon law was never uh, his theme. He was not a canonist. But yes, in the sense that his work helps us to understand the persistence of the canon law uh, in medieval and post-Reformation Scotland. And this contribution I think is best understood by taking a specific example, one uh, where our, our leader has uh, stated already, that is the law of marriage and divorce. How is it that Scott's law continued to follow the medieval canon law that validated marriages entered into wor by words of present consent? No formality beyond that being required. Isn't it strange that Protestant Scottish lawyers continue to accept the authority of the Popish canon law on this subject. We know that they did. However, considered that in 1550, this law had been the rule in Scotland for almost three centuries. The canon law on this point had worked its way into the minds and habits of the people. The only popish thing for Scots lawyers to have done would have been to accept the Council of Trent's decree, Tom Etsy, as valid in their courts, and that they did not do. And as it seems to me, David's sophisticated scholarship, his approach to my subject this morning, helps us to understand this aspect of the legal history of Scotland, the importance and the persistence of canon law in its development. The story he tells does not accord with the regime of legal positivism, but neither, I think, did the Scots law he described so well. Thank you. Thank you, Dick, very much. And now Gwen Seaborn is in line. Gwen um, is a professor of legal history at the University of Bristol. Gwen. Okay, yes, remember the mute button. Right, um, yes, I'm, so I'm representing common law today, English common law, um, although you might see a slightly blurry Welsh flag in the background, so I just have to say that. Um, but yes, uh, as uh, Hector McQueen has already emphasized, one of David Seller's big points was uh, this emphasis on the continuity of the connection and the influence um, of English common law, even past the Wars of Independence period. So potentially there's a huge amount that one could talk about here. Um, I would like to talk about how some of the discoveries, insights and methods in particular of David Seller can be important to current um, scholarship south of the border. So uh, I'm going to go with the uh, example method just because there is so much that one could talk about. And I'm going to focus on two chapters of the collection, that on courtesy and that on fourth of felony. So chapters 14 and 11, for those of you who've seen the collection. Um, both of these are examples, I think, of situations with definite parallels in development um, and also patchy evidence. And they're situations in which I think the two systems can be used to explain each other a little. Um, and that's something that I'd like to, uh, to think about. So turning to courtesy, first of all, um, there's a very exciting chapter in the collection, Courtesy Battle in the Breve of Right 1368, which is a really nice example of vivid historical storytelling apart from anything else. Um, and it is important to keep people's interest and get us excited about legal history. Um, so we'll get to the battle bit of it uh, in a moment. Let's just think about courtesy, first of all. And I'm sure pretty much everybody here knows, but I'll say it anyway. Um, courtesy is not just being lovely and polite in a slightly old fashioned way. It's, uh, it's a, 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 an interest in land. So tenancy by the courtesy of Scotland um, or the courtesy of England, uh, there's a slight spelling difference, which we won't dwell on, um, is, uh, was a life interest or life rent, which a widower might acquire in land, which his wife brought to the marriage uh, on certain conditions. And the most important condition for us here is that there'd been live issue of the marriage. So this is part of Scots law, Scots common law from medieval period onwards. 
uh, and is only finally removed in 1964, which is a lovely survival. And the English institution is very similar. That's finally got rid of, um, formally speaking, in the 1990s, but it's dead for a century before that. Um, as the chapter shows, the Seller chapter shows, there are both similarities and differences between England and Scots common laws on this. Um, and the particular interest that I've had in this is the vexed question of how to decide whether there had actually been a live born child. So if you have a dispute, one person says there was a live birth, the other person says there wasn't a live birth, how do you sort that one out? Um, the forms of English law push the answer, push us towards the answer being you do it with a jury, perhaps with some input from women who might have been around at the time, but that's a little controversial. Um, as Sellers' article shows, sometimes in some circumstances, definitely not uh, a regular thing, but in some circumstances, if the thing is being decided in a particular way with a particular form of action, um, then you might end up with battle. So we have this marvelous example in 1368 of a battle um, being, what's the word, awarded or ordered um, and preparations going ahead to fight the battle, all sorts of exciting information about just what armor people were ordering and so on. And it gets to, uh, to a certain point. Eventually I have to say that, that we don't have a kind of fight to the death, but you know, there is, this was the method that was to be used um, and that is interesting in and of itself. The case is between Sir Thomas Erskine and James Douglas uh, concerning light, uh, land mostly in the southern part of Scotland. So it was ordered that uh, this would be tried by battle. God would obviously favour the man with the just cause. Um, so although there is serious preparation and buying of all sorts of uh, warlike equipment, in the end, the dispute is settled. So an agreement is made that one of the parties shall have the land. Nevertheless, the fact that battle was even in the running as a mode of uh, deciding this is fascinating. So this very delicate, difficult question of was there life in this child now dead um, was to be decided by this, this very you know, uh, spectacular macho um, form of proof. And I think that says some quite interesting things. Uh, perhaps it's an acceptance that this is a really difficult question if you've got to throw it to trial by battle. Um, maybe, I'm not sure about this, you could say that there's some gender aspect here in comparison between England and Scotland. So uh, women are not involved at all in this trial by battle mode of proof, whereas they were to some extent uh, in the English mode of proof. So there's a big difference between the systems in the manner of proof, but the chapter also um, makes very good points about the similarities between the two systems. Very obviously these two things are interrelated. Um, and I found the discussion of similarities very useful when I was trying to fill in a bit of a gaping hole in the English evidence to do with um, how do you, uh, what is it you're asking when you're, when you're trying to get uh, information about whether the child was born alive. And in particular, a test which is put forward quite heavily in the 13th century English material is, uh, is the sound test. So the baby has to, has to cry. Um, but then that somewhat drops off the, uh, the face of records in England in the later medieval and early modern period. Um, but Sella has a wonderful quotation from Skeen, so from 1590s, um, which mentions the need for the child to make a sound. And it uses some absolutely fantastic language. The child has to be crying, braying, squealing, brilliant. Um, so it really reinforces the fact that that kind of idea um, was still out there in people's minds. And I think that to a certain extent can be used to fill in the, the gap that there is in English law. So my main point there is when there's an analogous piece of uh, law in Scotland and in England, um, it makes all sorts of sense when there's insufficient evidence to try and, you know, understanding of course that the systems are different, but to, uh, to think of it as something which can fill a gap. And I don't think we always do that. Um, I don't think people always reach for Scots law as a um, as a as something that that can uh, can do that job. So let me move on to the second of my examples, and I will say less about this because time marches on. Um, and that's the chapter on fourth of felony. So this is a less niche area. It's a key aspect of criminal uh, law. The 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 idea of um, what is the intention which is required 
in order to um, identify a homicide as being particularly heinous. So those things which are later um, classed as murder um, in the English system and, uh, and as, as deserving of capital punishment in the Scots system and as not being amenable to or not, not allowing the perpetrator to, uh, to claim sanctuary in the Scots system um, are tied up with this idea of premeditation and fourth of felony. And in a sense, this is a bit of the history of legal history. There was a big controversy about this um, in the 1960s to 1980s and uh, articles which disagree with each other about just what was the role of premeditation. And Sella makes some good points, some interesting points about the possibility of, um, of looking at the two systems together once again and uh, carrying over some of the Scots um, information into the English system. So I think there's not, it's not appropriate to go into great detail about just what the, the information is, but it's, it's a really important um, topic and one which has been picked up quite recently in very good work by Elizabeth Kamali, for example, um, looking at intention in felony. So I think that sort of area is still very much uh, under consideration. I also think it's quite important to note that he's talking about criminal law at all. So I'm taking two particular examples, but one of the big things I take from this collection is the breadth of the subject matter which is covered. And one of the things about legal history and particularly legal history teaching in English universities is it's often very narrow, actually. There are still some courses which are entirely about pri private law. And I think it's a great shame. So it's wonderful to see the criminal law bits and the family law bits finding their place in this collection as well. And the last thing I'll say about that homicide chapter is really something about what Hector's done with it rather than uh, what was necessarily there in the first place. Um, which is a very much like the bringing together of the fourth of felony material from Seller with some of his other work on straight history. So on um, uh, reinterpreting or nuancing the, the episodes of the killing by Robert Bruce of John Cummin um, and of uh, the Earl of Douglas by James II. And sort of thinking of those again um, in the context of what he has been saying about the importance of premeditation. And I think that definitely gives a, a fresh spin on, uh, on those in episodes which are very important for legal history, but for the history of England and Scotland in general as well. So I think that is my lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gwen. And thank you to all the speakers for sticking to the time. So we. To play, I'm assuming the chair uh, for uh, this uh, session. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for able chairmanship of the uh, the first session. Uh, I propose to follow your excellent example and keep any remarks extremely brief. Um, uh, and uh, in that case, the first thing to do is to introduce Caroline Humphreys, who alarmed me earlier today by sending me an emergency <laughs> copy of her text. Um, in case St Andrew's internet connections collapsed, but happily, obviously, they have not. So, Caroline, it is over to you on Roman law. <clears throat> Thank you very much. If there's one thing that I've learned about being in St Andrew's, it's not to trust the internet connection. <laughs> Thank you, Hector. So, it's a very great pleasure um, to be speaking today. Um, in place of Roman law, I realise that I'm going to begin somewhere which is effectively yet another um, kind of pion of praise for David Seller as a vivid storyteller. So I begin in 1884 with the celebrated German law professor and legal philosopher Rudolf von Jering, who in that year published a fantasy story and a collection of essays entitled Joking and Seriousness in Jurisprudence. The title alone is worth the read. <laughs> Yering's story in the heaven of concepts, which I'm sure is known to many here, sets out to satirize contemporary attempts at legal system building through the scientific reconstruction of Roman juristic texts and principles. Yering imagines a deceased Romanist being led by a soul guide through a series of ordered heavenly realms <laughs> before reaching the rarefied atmosphere of the heaven for legal concepts itself. 
in the heaven for legal concepts, personified juristic concepts such as dolus, property, contract and loan, happily spend their days exercising in a spiritual gymnasium. It includes a dialectical hair splitting machine. <laughs> and then they also having exercised themselves in the gymnasium, they leave and they argue amongst themselves. So as I was reading our volume for today, I found myself imagining what a seller-esque heaven of legal systems personified might look like. It would without doubt be a Scottish legal heaven, so let's place it in Edinburgh Law School's old college quadrangle, with I think five personifications, so one personification for each of the main legal systems discussed by Seller in this volume. First, Roman civilian law, who I think we should imagine being dressed in a toga. I apologize for the fact that I have not appeared to you in this form today. Celtic law in a tunic, canon law in a cassock, Scots law clad in the splendid tabard of the Lord Lion King of Arms, and English law, I think, in top hat and tails. Within this gathering, Scots law, Celtic law, and canon law are engaged in deep conversation with each other. English law is trying to speak loudly over the top of all of them, whilst Roman law listens intently, interrupting the discussion politely, but insistently on specific points. So for example, I'm imagining these personifications when their conversation turns to legal rights in movables, to unjust enrichment, to the topic of succession, promise or presumptions, this is when Roman law insistently makes her voice heard. So my general sense from Sella is of a gathering of old acquaintances who have known each other for quite literally centuries. In our virtual gathering today, I of course appear before you as Roman law. In reading the volume, I was struck by Seller's insistence that Scots law should not be viewed as, and I quote, a civilian system overlaid by the common law. Rather, as Hector mentioned at the beginning of our um, workshop today, Scots law should be viewed as a distinctive common law in its own right a pillar of national identity from the wars of independence of King Robert Bruce onwards. Coupled with a keen sense that Scots law may not have operated across the highlands and the lowlands in the same way. So Sellers insistence that Scots law was not at base a civilian system makes way for a nuanced and careful dissection of the so-called reception of Roman law in Scotland over centuries. As Sella states at the end of chapter seven, and I quote, the story of the reception of Roman law in Scotland is a complex one, which can only be properly understood against the background of a strong and resilient native tradition. So throughout the volume, the reader encounters numerous striking metaphors to describe the reception of Roman law into Scots law. Hector mentioned one, which I think might be my favorite, <laughs> the pressing of feudal wine into Roman bottles. We also learn about Roman law taking on, and I quote, the protective coloring of a thoroughly native species. We hear of the law of servitudes wearing a Roman mask and native institutions such as the legal rights in movables, and I quote, being dressed up in Roman garb. For Sella, the reception of Roman law in Scotland was thus a very gradual process to which, I quote from chapter seven, the common law of Scotland was resilient and adaptable in the face of the incoming tide of the civil law, another wonderful metaphor. Scotland drew upon the civil law rather than adopting it. Roman legal institutions, as Sella states in chapter 13 on succession law, were tailored to meet Scottish needs. <laughs> 
And Scottish needs, of course, varied and changed over time and across place. For example, some terminology of Roman law, as we shall hear in more detail later, was adopted in the field of succession. But Seller concludes that, again I quote, it's difficult to assess the influence of Roman law on the Scots law of succession. It was not negligible, but it certainly did not amount to a reception. Part of the complexity here, Seller argues, rightly in my opinion, lies in the fact that there were three channels of Roman influence operating. <clears throat> Roman influence via canon law, Secondly, Roman influence through Scotland's participation in the continental Ius Commune. And thirdly, the more direct influence of Justinian's digest in particular, as studied, for example, by early modern Scots lawyers at Dutch universities. It was entirely natural, states Seller, that Scots lawyers educated on the continent should use the terminology of Roman law but, crucially, he adds, this can be misleading. Hence, Seller states, the question is not simply one of reception, but rather, as he argues in chapter eight, what authority has been accorded to Roman law as a source of law in Scotland? So in chapter eight, entitled Scots Law Mixed from the Very Beginning with the all important question mark, A Tale of Two Receptions, originally published in 2000. Sellers turns to the time of Thomas Craig and Sir John Skeen to develop a point already made in chapter one, originally published in 1991, with reference to Viscount Stair's institutions. Roman law, argues Seller, was accepted into Scots law, not by reason of any innate authority, but because, as Hector mentioned earlier, of the good sense and equity of its solutions. Stair's common law, explains Seller in chapter one, was the common law of the world, the common learned law of Western Christendom. And this common law was founded on the principled rationality of Roman law. Thus, Seller argues, in agreement with Hector McQueen and Peter Stein, but at this point disagreeing with Peter Burks, the tradition of principled rationality inherited by Scots law from Roman law reaches back to the 16th century, and it affected not just the vocabulary, but the very grammar of Scots law itself. This insistence on the importance of the continental civilian tradition, at the same time as denying a full-scale reception of it within Scots law, also underpins Seller's analysis of promise in chapter 15 of the volume, originally published in 2000, and presumptions in chapter 16, originally published in 2009. Chapter 15 focuses on Stair's treatment of promise against the background of the canon law, the jus commune, and what Sellers calls actual Scottish practice. I thought it was interesting with this chapter, the opening sections state very insistently that the essay will be concerned with the period 1559-1560 through to 1681, but well over half the chapter Seller actually uses to trace the history of the doctrine of promise all the way through to the 1995 Requirements of Writing Scotland Act. So I think this goes back to something that Alice mentioned earlier, this incredible sense of sort of time, movement over time, historical development, um, giving you this grand sort of sweep um, that you can really engage with. Stella's conclusion here is twofold. First, and I quote, that Stair's treatment of promise needs to be considered in the context of the wider European intellectual tradition. And second, that the institutional writers who followed Stair lacked his clarity. And I love that phrase, it just drips with irony, doesn't it? It's the sort of thing you dread to see in a review of your own work. <laughs> Chapter 16 turns to presumptions, arguing that the story of presumptions in Scots law over the last three or four hundred years is relatively unproblematic. The treatment of the subject by Stair and other institutional writers, says Seller, is firmly based on jus commune divisions, 
I just want to mention briefly here that the early history of these use commune classifications are the subject of a very recently vivid and um, successfully vivid 2022 PhD thesis by David de Concilio, which includes an addition and translation of the first part of the late 12th, 12th century perpendiculum, which is of course itself a treatise on presumptions. So in this light, of this light of this new research on presumptions, I think Sellers was right to hint in 2009 that there is much work still to be done on the history of presumptions, both in terms of the jus commune and indeed Scots law too. So by way of conclusion, a critique. <laughs> Chapters 15 and 16 both stress what Seller terms actual Scottish practice. Yet there is one type of distinctive Scottish practice that curiously, to me at least, does not feature in Seller's collected writings, namely the Scottish art of advocacy. So here I am well aware that I am running the risk of seeming to criticise David Seller for not being more John Cairns, <laughs> and I think John you may well be in the audience here, but the story of Roman civilian law influence on Scots law surely must include the history of the Scots Bar. Volume one of John Cairn's collected essays clearly lays out the significance of an education in academic Roman law for Scottish advocates. And here I must confess that I particularly enjoy reading volume one of John's essays as it speaks to a time when St Andrews made provision for not one but two professors responsible for teaching the municipal and Roman laws. I always gloss over the account in John's volume one of the, um, his meticulous reconstruction of the story of William Wellwood, who was the last St Andrews Professor of Law, together with the potential for blood feud to end academic careers. So those of you who know the story of William Wellwood um, will, will know what I'm talking about. As John Cairns concludes, not only did the Roman law and the civilian tradition of the jus commune provide the advocates with legal arguments that allowed them to assert a high social status, the history of Roman law gave them the Roman jurists and the Roman orator as models for their profession. In other words, if David was with us today, I would argue that the distinctly Scottish civilian tradition is as much about institutionalized cultures of forensic argument as it is about native concepts dressed in Roman garb. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much for a very interesting um, uh, set of comments and uh, so on. And I'm sure when we get to the discussion, there'll be discussion of precisely these, these, these points. Um, but you've kept very well uh, to the allotted time slot. Uh, so shall we proceed <laughs> uh, to the next paper, which is from Tom Green uh, in Aberdeen, who's going to talk about um, uh, David's discussions of uh, the law of marriage. So Tom, over to you now. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, thank you. By the time that David Seller began his academic career, it appears that while work on the role of the canon law of marriage in pre-Reformation Scotland and in post-Reformation consistorial law had been provisionally or preliminarily examined by that early exponent of uh, comparative legal history, Frederick Walton, the role of the canon law of the medieval Catholic Church in the formation of Scots law more broadly does not appear to have fallen to be considered by legal historians until after the breakdown of the Scottish Presbyterian narrative of Scottish history. The breakdown of the Presbyterian narrative in the 1960s in part contributed to a fuller or revived engagement with the subject of the influence of medieval canon law on the formation of Scots law. But first, this tended to focus on the law of husband and wife, where the influence of canon law was direct and where that influence long survived within the context of the Protestant ascendancy. There seems little doubt, to my mind at least, that within the context of the 1960s, 
various scholars in the first flush of youth began to undertake a wide-ranging and fundamental re-examination of the Scottish evidence in its own right, increasingly free of the constraints of an officially authorised narrative of Scotland's history, long maintained by the universities for the preceding two and a half centuries. Seller appears to me uh, to fit within that group of scholars, which included many influenced by Gordon Donaldson, such as Athol Murray, David Smith, Peter McNeill and Duncan Shaw. Our knowledge of Scottish legal and ecclesiastical history is now far more grounded upon the evidence, particularly uh, for the medieval and uh, 16th, 17th century periods, and all the myriad complexity to which that gives rise. It is undoubtedly the case that while Scotland rejected many aspects of medieval Catholicism, canon law itself continued as a great authority among the Scots, notwithstanding its direct relationship with the bishops of Rome and notwithstanding the Reformation. Marriage law remained the primary context within which Scottish legal historians considered the influence of canon law upon Scots law. This is quite clear from David Stella's own work, and in particular from two of the articles contained in the volume whose publication we are marking. I can still recall being a young postgraduate in the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh, reading the canons of the Fourth Lateran Council and reading about the formation of the classical canon law through the works of scholars such as Walter Ullman, Stefan Kuttner and Brian Tierney. This was simply an academic interest. But through the scholarship of David Seller, I came rapidly to realise that the classical canon law of the high medieval church had played a central role in the development not only of marriage law in Scotland, but also in the fields of procedure, among others. And more generally, through the stimulus of David's work, I began to see that since the classical canon law was profoundly indebted in terms of its jurisprudential sophistication to the 12th century Renaissance in civil law in the Northern Italian law schools, the canon law, since directly enforced in Scotland for several centuries, had acted as a vehicle for the reception of civilian principles into Scots law. I can still recall as a young postgraduate reading David's article on canon law and Scots law replicated in this volume. It is a seminal article, like many of the articles that I've read in this volume since receiving the typeset copy. It's a sort of actual article that actually made my heart beat a little quicker when reading it. So you can see the best years of my youth were sent in fairly. <laughs> Not, you know, anyway, right, I'll say no more. When reading it, and I suddenly realised that what for me had simply been a kind of intellectual refuge of certain historical knowledge within the swirling vortex of a Scottish school of divinity, but the canon law of the high middle ages was still relevant for understanding the history of Scots law and the civilian tradition. Again, David's work like that of Walton's focused on consistorial questions. In this respect, there is a case study par excellence of the influence of the canon law of marriage in Scots law, and one which was still directly relevant when David published an article on marriage by cohabitation with habit and repute in the early 1990s. David took the view that the doctrine of marriage by cohabitation with habit and repute had its origins in a papal rescript of Pope Alexander III, which was promulgated throughout Western Christendom in 1234 by Pope Gregory IX, and which law had been the law of Scotland. By the 1990s, the work of Professor Richard Helmholtz and other experts in the history of canon law was available in much greater abundance as to substantive law than it had been in the 1960s. In part under Helmholtz's influence, David had begun to read the great authorities on the canon law, most markedly Panormitanus or Panormitimus, as some will say, not only because Helmholtz recommended this expressly as the best commentary on the presumptions arising from cohabitation with habit and repute, but because the founder of the University of Aberdeen, William Elphinstone, when he had sat as an official of Glasgow and an official of Edinburgh, had had these very commentaries upon his shelf. 
In the cohabitation with habit and repute article, Seller offered a masterful presentation of the classical canon law and traced the retention of the canon law doctrine through Scott's consistorial law and through the Scots law of husband and wife. And Seller, scholar that he was, had no ax to grind, no a priori position to defend. Rather, his highly developed sense of the value of on the one hand, historical evidence, and on the other, the authority of sources of law, allowed him to argue persuasively that the great authority on the law of husband and wife in succession to Frederick Walton, namely Eric Clive, had fundamentally misunderstood the Scots law doctrine of marriage by cohabitation with habit and repute. Time does not permit me to enter into the dispute that arose between Seller, as the most distinguished legal historian of his generation in Scotland, and Clive, undoubtedly the greatest authority on the Scots law of husband and wife of his generation. But suffice to say that the dispute which arose between them was not resolved. I've recently taken the liberty of revising the whole affair, and under the influence of Seller's writings, have revisited the dispute through a deconstruction of all the relevant footnotes and through, as Seller himself enjoined us to do, engaging directly with the texts of the canon law and the great commentaries thereupon, and in so doing have sought to resolve the fundamental differences which arose between Seller and Clive. And having presented on this to the Scottish Legal History Group with uh, Professor McQueen chairing, I hope it's safe to say, I hope it's safe to say, that Seller was more right than he fully realized, or at least fully expressed in print. That's a hallmark of all the work of people like McNeil and Smith and Seller. I, I think they often knew more than they ever committed to print, but well, it will have to remain a, a, an, un, an unknowable. I've now lost my place. I won't start talking about Peppa Pig. Hang on, uh, let's just uh, write. And why was this? Why was Seller, why does he look to be so right or even more right than he realized? Well, for me, it was because Seller followed the evidence without preconceived ideas. Historical knowledge was not to be achieved by having a theory which was then substantiated by the evidence, <clears throat> but rather by searching for a theory dictated by the evidence. And in the area of cohabitation with habit and repute, Historical evidence as a source of authority for historical knowledge and legal evidence as a source of authority for the law coincided and coalesced. Seller simply followed the evidence and based his opinions and views upon that evidence, understanding fully the interplay of the qualities of evidence as to historical knowledge and as to the law. Seller's article on canon law and Scots law is seminal for the history of the canon law influence on Scots law. His article on cohabitation with habit and repute withstands the closest and most robust scrutiny to which I, at least, can subject it. And it not only stands, but again proves to be seminal. To close, in terms of the history of canon law and Scots law, there is a great deal of work which remains to be done. David variously held that the civilian tradition in Scots law was in substantial part created via the canon law in the first instance. As expanded upon in his article mixed from the very beginning, it appears to be David's thesis that the Corpus Juris Canonici and the commentaries arising therefrom was a major vehicle by which the civilian principles by which the canon law had been enriched were received into Scots law. A great deal of work has yet to be done on this head because we are dealing with subtler and more indirect influences on the legal culture from the legal culture of the higher Middle Ages. The somewhat overwhelming volume of source material that may be consulted in Scotland has been presented before us in Dollars Arlach, Scotland under the Jus Commune. And given my prior experience of engaging in detail with the scholarship of David Seller as to canon law, I think that his own observations as to the role of canon law in the Scottish civilian tradition undoubtedly act as a guiding light by which further research in that field of inquiry should be undertaken. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. <clears throat> uh, also keeping nicely to time and um,
uh, providing us with lots of food for thought and reflection, which I hope we will take up in the uh, discussion uh, at the end of the afternoon. Um, but for now, we must move on. And it's uh, Stephanie Drokulic, who is going to uh, talk now about uh, criminal law, the second of the, I think, three substantive topics we've chosen this afternoon, because they obviously were of the greatest interest uh, to uh, David Seller. So Stephanie, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd like to thank the organizers and Hector and Alexandra for the invitation to come along and speak today. Um, I've been asked to consider um, this afternoon the impact that David Seller's work had on Scots criminal law. Unfortunately, never had the opportunity to meet him um, either in person or online, <laughs> um, but his work most certainly has impacted on my own research. Um, I'd like to focus um, this afternoon particularly on what he has highlighted in his chapter on forethought felony malice, they forethought and the classification on homicide. This chapter also now includes a part of another piece of work, um, which Gwen had quickly referenced, um, was it murder, um, which I believe adds a very interesting development to the concepts associated and attached to the prosecution of homicide, and indeed throws a new light um, on this topic as well. I'd like to also um, start the discussion, um, as many have noted, um, that the collection not only demonstrates David's um, wide reaching impact on Scots law, but also to highlighting the importance of the study of Scottish legal history. Um, in particular, those new to the subject or wishing to engage with the study of Scots law can now look to the, the collection from a very broad overview of some of the key developments as well as contentious issues, as well as those that need further examination that Thomas just um, spoke on as well. I found this chapter when I first engaged with it um, a few years back um, for my research masters, um, particularly interesting in the approach that David took to the study and the development of homicide. Um, Hector points out in the introduction that um, David Seller's technique was not particularly based on archival research or upon a close examination of the manuscripts behind the sources. Rather, he worked with available sources alongside that which of Skeen, Craig and Stair. He also adopted an approach that was quite unique or um, from my perspective unique, particularly for uh, criminal law. The idea of looking from what's known to the unknown, so looking to the problem or looking at the problem to find the cause and the process. Um, this is noted particularly in other elements of the chapters um, for Celtic law, for example. The study of criminal law so often focuses on the judicial developments um, or perhaps the common law more broadly, um, but there is so much more to the study of criminal law, the use of legislation, terms of art, elements of proof and evidence, those who are connected to the raising and prosecution of, of, of actions, but also the social, cultural, and theoretical influences which have impacted on the development of criminal law and practice. The forces, if you will, which have shaped the criminal law. Sellers, uh, David Seller's understanding of the continuity of legal development, the process of integration of external influences with indigenous customs also allows for unique understanding in the context of homicide. David's chapter situates his examination of the law of homicide within the broader debate surrounding the meaning of malice aforethought in modern English law. He was critical of understanding the circumstances, if any, in which malice aforethought had carried its obvious and literal meaning of premeditation or where it signaled a deliberate and intentional killing. Critical to this understanding was the rise in the distinction between murder and manslaughter and critically the very development which took place to indicate the changing nature of the terms associated with homicide. David's chapter articulates that there is a lack of understanding in this area. He notes that apart from some studies on assignment, that is the compensation paid to kin for mutilation or slaughter, and the blood feud which was so closely associated with it, very little has been written about the development of the law of homicide in Scotland. Further to this, he outlines the backdrop of notable and many studies researched um, and writing in England, which I might add is probably still very much the case today. David's chapter outlines the early development of murder, noting the classification found in Regium, which contrasted murder with simple homicide or what he referred to as simple homicide. He traces this development further by examining several statutes from the 14th century and onwards. The examination provides in insight into slight but significant developments which are occurring in the classification of homicide and the legal distinction between various types of killing and the blameworthiness associated to those acts and also the connection with the terms of use of, or terms of art used in practice. 
David argues that it's clear that a classification is emerging between the later 14th to the early to the 18th century, and that this development is in the division between murder and what he refers to as simple homicide but also importantly, connecting the methods and means of proof. He differentiates between murder moving beyond its more restrictive meaning of a secret killing to cover all killing done by forethought felony and contrast this with killing which would have been done or appeared to not be premeditated, but rather in the heat of the moment, which is referred to as Chad Mali. He argued that this new classification had moved away from the language associated with the blood food towards a more public criminal law as all killings became technically criminal. The tracing of this development of the division in homicide and the requisite defenses which might be pleaded and punishments administered thereafter are also commented upon this tracing of development between the 14th and 18th century. To highlight the changing nature of forethought felony, he makes particular reference to Sir Gilbert Hayes' translation in Scots of Honor Bonnet's Arbum de Baptism. He highlights a specific passage with which duplicates terms of art used in practice, as well as the distinction between slaughter by forethought felony and slaughter by chod mali. He references killing by forethought felony, which was deemed to be unnatural against the law of nature, and killing chod mali, on the other hand, which was sinful, but less so as the result of the nature of passion. The first, Seller argues, is that which deserved description of murder, reserved for the type of killing deemed mo most reprehensible by, by society. The second, he argues, did not warrant such a description. Seller argues that there is a danger also of misunderstanding and misjudging the reaction of contemporaries by describing those who kill in hot blood as murder. He also draws into his comparison the tract written by Skeen of Crimes and Judges and Criminal Causes, which was included in the 1609 translation of Regium. Here, Skeen writes of slaughter and, man and manslaughter committed voluntarily by forethought felony or casually by Chad Mali, generally is punished by death. The juxta juxtaposition which David, David drew on is the use of voluntary and casual in this passage, which he highlighted was also used in the 1649 Act following thereafter, Hume, and can also be traced to civilian and canon law. The 1649 Act, for example, detailed the types of homicide which could could not carry the death penalty. And although, although this act does not itself tell us what casual might mean, it does rather detail circumstances which might be construed as a homicide committed more casually, rather than that um, killing by chance perhaps, or what killing um, in a casual mere accident or those contrasted killing culpably or negligently. He also highlights that this was not settled by the act of 1649, but further considered in practice before the courts. This development overall, he argues, signifies that those who were deemed other than murders were able to benefit from not only sanctuary, but also royal pardon, which he argues moved away from the blood feud towards more public criminal law. Ultimately, his chapter highlights this and signifies that the mental element became more significantly important to the prosecution of homicide. He argues that murder was, was thus an unlawful killing with malice aforethought and slaughter an unlawful killing without malice aforethought. However, he cautions against a strict or precise meaning to the various terms associated with those, terms such as casual, deliberate, and malice aforethought, as these terms had several shades of meaning, particularly when referenced to the practice with which these were used, and precise nuances which were also attached depending on the circumstances, and the circumstances of homicide could be invariantly varied as well. He takes on the development of the terms associated with murder and the classification of homicide more broadly and connects this to the difficulty in identifying a specific point in which the translation is said to have happened. He instead highlights the importance of a gradual process and change in the classification of homicide. Importantly, the influences from different jurisdictions and from sources as well. This connects to his overall argument, which presents in other chapters, but more specifically on, his ch on chapter eight, Scott's Law Mix from the very beginning. My own research has sought to, to develop upon this understanding of homicide, particularly in the 17th century. Well, so I have not found much use of the terms forethought, um, felony, and child mal in the records, I have noted the use of circumstances libeled in connection to the homicide, which were ultimately used to show the nature of the killing, which tended to indicate a premeditation. This also connects with Seller's excerpted sections um, from in the chapter. Um, in which it argued that the use of the formulaic terms construed in practice and distinction between the types of homicide. However, much more is needed to fully understand the shifting practice in these terms of art. 
and what they signify for the prosecution and classification of homicide. Importantly, the changing nature of these terms of art to understand the degrees of culpability and to seek to understand how the law came to focus on the blameworthiness of the accused conduct in connection to the prosecution of homicide. I'd like to close in a similar way in which Seller began his own um, chapter on forethought, a note regarding the contemporary importance of the historical development of homicide. Seller notes that the meaning attached to the terms malice aforethought was a topical issue during the writing of his piece, particularly referencing the House of Lords Select Committee, which heard evidence from both jurisdictions before reporting in 1989, as well as in several engagements prior to this. And as I speak now, I also note the topical issue in modern Scots law. In 2018, the Scots Law Commission announced their project to examine the law of homicide, which seeks to understand the extent to which necessary proposals need to be made regarding the modernization of the law. Discussion papers and consultation period also just happened shortly over a year ago. Indeed, as Seller highlighted and as indicative of my own interest in the topic, seeking to question the extent to which we understand the development in the use of the terms specifically connected to murder and slaughter, and also how the constructions of these terms changed in practice, both of which impact upon our understanding of the development of the law of homicide. Thank you, Stephanie. That's very interesting comments indeed. And you also maintaining the, uh, the time. Um, I, I think we're going to have some time for discussion, which is tremendous. Alexandra, are you all set to go on the succession? Yes, I think so. Lovely. Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, OK, excellent. Thank you. Um, so the way I've approached uh, today's task was to ask myself, why should succession lawyers read David Seller's work and what can we learn from his insights, but in particular his approach to succession and succession law. And uh, just like other parts of David Seller's work discussed earlier, his work on succession law is full of stimulating reflections. And there are many aspects I could have uh, decided to talk about, including his fascination with the question of how mixed Scots succession law is, the terminology of Scots succession law that Caroline Humphreys has already spoken about, but also the theme of inequality that seems to come through in his work. But there are two further aspects to David Seller's approach that struck me when reading him. In particular, I'm referring here to chapters 12 and 13 of the volume. First, it seems that David Seller understood the term succession in broad terms. In other words, he was not merely interested in the transfer of wealth on death, but also, and perhaps especially, in genealogy, and in particular clan genealogy, and succession to offices, titles, and names. Second, and I think this is somewhat related to the first point, David Seller was able to relate succession law to other areas of the law, including family law and criminal law. And partly, this seems to be a reflection of the fact that he's had such broad interests, but also that he taught across a number of uh, areas of law, including within private law. In the time I have, I'd like to explore both of these aspects and just mention some of the examples from the two chapters uh, in this book. Now, David Seller understood succession in both terms. I think we can see that in the chapter 12, where he speaks on juridical acts made in contemplation of death. And here he mentions not just uh, how land could be transferred on death, but he also talks about the committal titles and how they could be passed. And in that same contribution, David Seller also engages with the motivations that underpin dispositions that are made in contemplation of death. In particular, he states that among those reasons are, and I quote, the repayment of debts and obligations, recompense for services uh, rendered, legacies to friends and relatives, gifts to charities, donations for religious purposes, and the like. Thus, David Seller points to the fact that testamentary dispositions are not necessarily unilateral nor altruistic. They may not just be a gift, but can, for instance, be part of some sort of exchange. And they may, of course, reflect the testator's personal beliefs. Thus, there is more to wills than one might think. More importantly, it seems to me that David Seller draws our attention to the fact that testators often seek to preserve their name 
and the name of their family. Thus, through his interest in the succession to names and titles, he's able to alert us to some of the broader motivations underpinning dispositions in contemplation of death. Names could be preserved, obviously, in a number of different ways through offspring, but also he mentions the foundation of a school or an institution that was named after the deceased, but also elaborate funeral monuments, some more extravagant than others, and here, obviously, the McKay cases come to mind. However, David Seller also refers us to another practice aimed at preserving the name of the deceased, and that's the practice of limiting succession to heritage to those bearing a particular surname, whether by means of an entail or a special destination. And this concern uh, to preserve the name was not confined, it seems, to the clannish highlands. Uh, in fact, David Seller cites Lord Stair and the fact that Stair himself stated that the expediency of Thales, Thales, am I right here? Um, Hector gave me a crash course before um, in, uh, <laughs> in Scots legal terminology. Uh, Thales is the Scottish uh, uh, dialect for the term entail. Um, and Lord Stair, uh, Stair says, this is the same with primogeniture, the point being to preserve the memory and the dignity of families. Now, in this context, David Seller further mentions the so-called name and arms clause to the inheritance of property. And such a clause made succession to property conditional on the assumption of the name and coat of arms of the family in question. Uh, while such conditions may be unusual today, there's an interesting Court of Appeal decision of 2012, uh, where the question arose whether a party had actually complied with such a clause. So I think by taking a holistic approach to succession, and in particular by connecting his interest in succession law to his interest in the succession to title and names, David Seller was able to see the testamentary dispositions are not just about the transfer of wealth, but they fulfill a number of different complex functions and that they are motivated by a host of different considerations. Yet, modern succession literature often pays very little attention to the fact that preserving the name, but also the memory and dignity of the deceased and of her family are important motivations underpinning dispositions in contemplation of death. But David Seller's work further alerts us to the fact that it's not merely through dispositions of wealth or the creation of wealth structures that can persist over time, and here I'm thinking of dynastic trusts, that a person can try to ensure continuity beyond death. Thus, by drawing interesting connections across the different facets of the succession to a person, David Seller was able to capture more fully what succession is about and um, what matters to the human being who is confronted with her own mortality. Aside from highlighting the complexities of the process of succession and the underpinning motivations, in his work, David Seller also draws important connections with other areas of the law in which he had an interest in. For instance, his interest in family law and marriage meant that he was able to see marriage as a means through which succession patterns could be affected. And that marriage was, and to some extent still is, I think, an important estate planning tool is uh, not always um, acknowledged in the succession literature. Also, when succession, uh, when discussing, sorry, in chapter 12 in his book, The Limitations to Juridical Acts Made in Contemplation of Death, David Seller would not just mention what one might expect uh, legal rights, that is a uh, forced heirship, but he also included an interesting small section on civil death. Now, the effect of the doctrine of civil death is that a person, though biologically alive, is declared dead for the purposes of the law. And that obviously has serious consequences, including, but not only, for the transfer of wealth on death. <clears throat> 
As David Seller mentions in his uh, contribution, historically, civil death was often a consequence of entering a monastery or religious order, but was also recognized in the context of banishment for life or a sentence of outlawry, which was recognized in Scots law until 1949. Apparently, at least that's uh, how far I've come with my research, the concept has been transposed to Scotland from England. In England, banishment, it seems, occurred when a man was attainted by act of parliament and cast from the realm forever. Apparently, there were three principal consequences that followed upon the attainder for treason or felony in England, and that was extinction of civil rights, forfeiture and corruption of blood. Now, forfeiture was part of, it seems, the punishment of a crime by which goods, chattels, lands and tenements of the attainted felon were forfeited to the victim's kin. Whereas according to the doctrine of corruption of blood, the blood of the attainted person was held to be corrupt so that he could not transmit his estate to his heirs, nor could they inherit. In other words, the person attainted for conviction of a felony or treason was disqualified from inheriting or transmitting property, and his descendants were forever barred from any inheritance of his rights to title. Civil death and the other incidents of attainder were never part of the common law recognized in the US. However, and here I hope that you, uh, the US lawyers are not going to prove me wrong, um, in the US civil death re was revived by statute in several states. And it was seen as a practical way of settling the earthly affairs of a convicted felon soon to be executed. The idea was to emulate the results natural death would produce. As a consequence, convicted felons not only lacked the ability to sue in court, they were also deemed to be dead with respect to the bond of matrimony, and they were deemed to have surrendered their property rights. Consequently, in some states, property rights would automatically pass to the prisoner's heirs. And if a prisoner was released from prison before natural death, that could then lead to anomalous situations. Interestingly, these civil death statutes are still alive in three US states, Rhode Island, New York, and the Virgin Islands. And they retain civil death statutes for persons sentenced to life imprisonment. However, um, on 2 March uh, 2020, so just over two weeks ago, the Supreme Court of Rhode Island has declared the civil death statute of Rhode Island not compliant with its constitution, which guarantees all people access to the judicial system. Thus, succession matters can impact it in a number of different ways, including through criminal law provisions. David Seller's work here, I think, is instructive as he invites us not to look not only beyond the confines of what pertains formally to succession law, but also to study succession law in connection with other areas of the law, be that family or criminal law. David Seller's work thus highlights the interconnectedness of succession law with many other areas of the law, but also it shows that what it means to be dead is much more complex than it might appear. Thank you. Hector, I think yes, you're muted. I am. It had to happen. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you for keeping to the time. The only thought I have is your last remark, uh, is that the only person who doesn't care is the deceased. <laughs> but that's another uh, deep question that we won't uh, pursue exactly. in any detail. There are some people who would dis disagree discussion. with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK. Uh, our final paper is from uh, Remco van Rie, who has been given I think a sweeper function. Um, can I just be sure, Remco, that you have uh, control of your screen because you are the first and only uh, speaker to make use of PowerPoint? I think I'm in control, Hector. So Excellent. let's uh, let's <clears throat> see what uh, what happens. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure for me and an honour uh, 
to participate in today's book launch. Uh, that is to say a presentation, the presentation of a selection of uh, essays in Scots legal history written by, uh, by David Seller. Um, while reading the essays, I realized uh, once again uh, whom we have lost with, uh, with David. I think he can be qualified as a giant of legal history, uh, a colleague whose scholarly views have impacted profoundly on teaching and research, uh, not only in the field of legal history, but also beyond in the study of the law in, in general. Uh, I still, it, it is still very sad to think that he has, uh, has passed away um, and I miss him, uh, him very much. Um, I met David for the first time uh, when I was an Erasmus student at Edinburgh University in 1990. Uh, that is now 32 years ago. Um, at that time, I did not know that the name Seller has Celtic origins, something I only learned when reading one of the essays in the volume. But at the time, I obviously noted that David was very evidently a Scotsman. My professor of Roman law at the time, uh, his name is Jeroen Gorus, um, who himself spent time in Edinburgh in the late 1960s or early 1970s, recommended David's course on Scots legal history, and that recommendation proved to be excellent indeed. In his course, David, um, if I may quote uh, uh, Hector McQueen, David knowledgeably straddled the divide between modern law and legal history. And it was exactly that aspect of the course that made it so interesting for young law students. Many of the central themes of the volume of collected essays, which uh, is presented today, um, and which are so carefully put together by, by Hector, um, were discussed in, in the course, in our course. We learned about continuity in the development of Scots law. And we were informed about the fact that the history of Scots law is one of great antiquity. Celtic law, canon law, civil law, feudal law, and the English common law. We studied it all in the context of a Scottish common law, mixed from the beginning to paraphrase uh, the title of one of David's articles in, in the book and uh, which has been referred to, to uh, by, by some of you. David not only taught his subject in a manner that made it very worthwhile for his students, his teachings were reinforced by the fact that he and his wife Sue were extremely welcoming to us socially. After, join, after having joined him at the Staff Club, which is an institution that, uh, uh, that used to be in Chambers Street and that has long since disappeared. Uh, after joining him at the Staff Club, I was invited to their home in Eildon Street, where I not only met his or their then very young sons, they're now grown up big men, uh, but where many a pleasant evening was spent with good food, whiskey, and interesting and inspiring conversation. Eildon Street was also the place where later I was introduced to two of David's PhD students, Mark Godfrey and John Finley. And later Eildon Street was the place where we inspected the heavily embroidered official costume of the Lord Lion King of Arms, an office David held from 2008 until 2014. And that costume was not very comfortable to say the least, but it was worn with, uh, with pride. Now, David not only supervised Godfrey and Finley, but he also advised me when writing my doctorate at Leiden University in, in the Netherlands. David became, became one of the external supervisors. And he was fascinated by the results of the archival research done by Godfrey, Finley, and myself, even though it may have been true as we read in the volume that he never managed to devote significant time to purely archival research himself. It seems that his retrogressive method that has also been mentioned earlier on um, from the known to the unknown sufficed. And I think that today's volume may serve as proof of this. The subject of my doctorate was the history of civil procedure in the Low Countries, and writing on this topic in English proved to be a challenge. However, due to David's help, I managed, and he not only taught me a lot about procedural terminology, but also about civil procedure in general. After all, he had been a practicing lawyer when a young man. For a continental legal historian, procedure is a very interesting area of Scots law. <clears throat> 
since unlike many other fields of Scott law, Scots law, not only the terminology of Roman law and its structure and intellectual coherence is present, but also the substance of the learned Romano canonical procedure. And for that reason, I first read, actually I, I reread the essays in the volume that deal with procedural matters. One of these essays discusses the law of presumptions. We have already noted that. It was originally published in a volume of a series named Comparative Studies in Continental and Anglo-American Legal History, sponsored by the German Gerda Henkel Stiftung. By the way, the most recent volume in this series on European Central Courts is dedicated to the memory of David. The volume I'm now referring to on, on presumptions was coordinated by Professor Dick Helmholtz from Chicago, he's present here today, in partnership with uh, David, who hosted one of the meetings of the working group in Edinburgh. And while rereading David's writings on procedural matters, I was struck by the fact that even though we discuss the history of procedure time and time again, we still did not discuss all relevant matters. An example, which could have been discussed with a few glasses of whiskey, I must admit, is where in his essay on presumptions, David refers to our colleague and friend from Stellenbosch, Professor Jacques Duplessis, who noted that in Roman Dutch law, a violent presumption of adultery and hoerereie, which means something like uh, prostitution in Dutch, came into being when a young man and a young woman were found naked in bed together. But actually, this presumption is much older than the Roman Dutch law. It was discussed by Philips Wieland, a late 15th and early 16th century lawyer uh, from Flanders. Um, but Wieland did not mention that the young man and the young woman were naked. This was later added by Joost de Damhouder, a 16th century lawyer and legal author who plagiarized Wieland to a considerable extent. But, and now I'm going to share my screen, I, let's hope that it works, and I think it does. I hope you can see my screen. Um, um, the Damhouder apparently knew the Liber Extra of the canon law well, since it is there that we meet all of this nudity. Uh, we see there in the text that uh, the couple was nude uh, laying together in, in bed. Uh, the Damhouder's treatise not only provides text, but also woodcuts. And I'm sure that the woodcut depicting the situation where a presumption of adultery comes into being has turned out to be much more interesting than without the Liber Extra and without Joost the Damhouder. I'm going to show you the, the picture. Here it is. Um, curiously, the, in the woodcut, we only see a naked man eh, on the right-hand side. The woman, on the contrary, is hiding chastely under a blanket on the left side of the bed. And this is because the couple has evidently just been surprised in their bedroom by a third person. And that person on the left must be the person that testified in court. His testimony has given rise to the presumption that something very bad had happened before he entered the room. As Wieland states, when a young, young man and a young woman are found together in bed, the law presumes evil. There are also other matters that are raised by David in his essays that I would like to discuss, uh, that I would have liked to discuss with him. Several times, David establishes a link between Scandinavian and Scots law in a very compelling manner. But what I'm sometimes missing, but that is only because I'm a Dutchman, uh, are references to the Low Countries. As you may know, Scots and my own native tongue, Dutch, have quite a few words in common. On a Sunday, both Scots, Scotsmen and Dutchmen would go to church. In Scots, the building they would visit is a kirk, whereas in Dutch, the building is called kerk. The Dutch bury their dead in a kist, and the same is done in Scotland. The English, on the contrary, seem to use a coffin for that purpose. Similarities may also be noted in legal parlance. In one of his essays, David refers to the Scandinavian institution of the ting, the ting, 
and the ceremony of fencing the court. Once a regular feature of Scottish court procedure, David observes, found also in Scandinavia and the Isle of Man, but apparently nowhere else. However, the same procedure existed in the medieval Low Countries, and there is reason to believe that the Scandinavian, Scots, and Dutch procedures may have a common root. Ting is ding in Dutch, a word that we still find in modern Dutch as part of the word referring to a lawsuit, geding. And I'm now going to show you another slide, the last slide. Um, in Maastricht, uh, the town where my university is based, one of the oldest civil buildings in town is the so-called Dinghuis, the house of the Ting, a courthouse, we would call it uh, today. And fencing the court was a regular feature of the procedure of a medieval municipal court, the so-called Schepenbank or Schaffenbank in German, which in medieval times was initiated by putting four benches in a quadrant. It would have been very nice to have David's opinion on the relationship between this procedure and fencing the court in Scotland. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there is Burr Law discussed in another essay in today's volume. David has established the Scandinavian origins of Burr Law, but he also mentions the Scottish institutional writer John Skeen, who states about Burr Law, it is a Dutch word, David, David rightly adds, that is to say German, for Bauer or Bauersman in Dutch is Rusticus and Husbandman. But a Dutch speaker from the Low Countries would not have made the association with farmer right away. That person instinctively would have thought of the word for neighbor in Dutch, which is buur. And note that buur uh, is the last syllable of the English word for uh, in, in neighbor. The law governing the relationship between neighbors or buren in Dutch was a familiar part of the law in the medieval Low Countries. Buur law would then mean something like neighbor law or the law governing the relationships between neighbors. Now, obviously, etymology is a difficult topic, and many lawyers will not be familiar with it, but I would have liked to raise this point with David during one of our conversations in Eildon Street. I wished I had read his essay on Burr Law earlier. I would like to come to a conclusion. Today, we have discussed the life and works of David Seller, and for many of us, David is the face of Scottish legal history. For me, he presented Edinburgh, its university, and Scotland at large. I'm grateful that Hector has taken the initiative to publish David's most important essays in one volume with Edinburgh, Edinburgh University Press. I think that the book will be a lasting memory to one of the kindest legal historians I've known, and someone that may serve as an example for many others in the field. As I've stated before, he is dearly missed. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Remco, and uh, uh, some nice illustrations with which to uh, finish. Uh, and you and I have, uh, in email exchanges, discussed the great difficulties for lawyers, even legal historians of etymology, um, but so, some of what our conversation and some of the other material that's been advanced here has made me wonder about uh, a rather different version of the common European legal past than is usually presented in, uh, in, in, in books and which we haven't pursued perhaps because of linguistic uh, limitations. So thank you. Now...